Hey guys, it's Payne. I'm really excited to introduce a brand new show to Bet the Board that combines sports and alternative investing, the very first of its kind. Sports betting and collectibles converging is inevitable. Let me tell you why. Sports cards and memorabilia are another way to get money into the market and do it without limit restrictions or the substantial hold you're accustomed to with sports betting. Whether you collected cards as a kid and are looking to get back into the hobby, this podcast is for you. If you've been collecting cards for years, this podcast will make you think and operate more efficiently. Are you in real estate? The parallels to investing in sports cards and memorabilia are uncanny. You're on Wall Street. Well, listen close. The best sports cards have outperformed the S&P 500 by 6x since 2013. And during the 2008 market crash, sports cards held up better than the S&P 500. Bet the Board, in conjunction with PWCC, presents Cardboard Chat, an entertaining, sophisticated, and informative podcast that combines sports, analytics, betting, cards, and memorabilia. Without further ado, this is Cardboard Chat, with Jesse Craig, a leading figure in the collectible space, and me, Payne. Not the best of news for you today in your Oregon Ducks. We talked about this a couple podcasts ago, and Dante Moore was throwing up the O, and today it comes down, he's going to UCLA. That's, God, you really like to start these things off with just zingers, huh? Look, it's the a truth sports is, show. When, I know, I mean, God, my poor Ducks. But look, Bo Nix is coming back. That's the good news, right? And I knew, based on Moore wanting to start as a freshman, that Bo Nix coming back for another year would would affect that and likely would you know send more to UCLA, which is what happened. And you were telling me before we came on the air that the NIL deal he got from UCLA is somehow bigger than Oregon's. It's hard to believe. Yep, that is that's the word. It's the wild, wild west out there. Crazy. This is what the NCAA really set is. up. That's uh, that's interesting. I wish uh, I wish that a lot of those guys, you know, back in the day, could have experienced that. I mean, people that went to yeah, there's people in jail for for bribery and shit like that, and <laughs> from the NCAA. Yep. Other breaking news here, as we got on this podcast, Ooh. Jalen Hurts. Big breaking news. Sh- yeah. Uh-oh. Shoulder injury. Let's see how long that is. I'm hearing collarbone. Not good. Not good. There goes your MVP. There goes your playoffs. Unless the mustache, Mr. Gardner Minshew, can come out and keep the franchise afloat. This will be the interesting story because right now, obviously, with the... Let me phrase this so we don't get in trouble here. The Jalen Hurts news was kind of suspected overnight, and we're recording this on, on Monday afternoon. It'll come out Tuesday morning. But we watched Jalen Hurts get landed on had a tough time getting back up. The throws didn't have much zip on them at the end of the Bears game. And so some sophisticated bettors were getting out ahead of this news and betting Patrick Mahomes to win MVP. So I'm not sure those odds of Mahomes minus 120 to win MVP will be there when this podcast (laughs) releases on Tuesday morning. But if they are, probably worth a few shekels. Yeah, it's not looking good. Those, I mean, collarbones are, you're out what? Is that four to six months? Depends. Typically? Yeah, just depends. Depends. We'll see what transpires here. I think more concrete information will come out over the next 24 to 48 hours. But Sure. Uh, yeah, Gardner but Minshew for, for, is better than I think a lot of people believe. And in this system, course. that's, that's I think, you know, aside from the numbers, of which Patrick Mahomes right now is is number one in EPA plus completion percentage over expectation. It, we, he's kind of created this baseline that's so high we just expect him to play to that standard. And when he does and goes out and you know goes thirty six of forty one against the Texans, no one talks about it. But um, which is crazy. Yes. Like can we can we can we talk about that for a second? Seriously, like that's insane. And his defense. His defense need to figure it out, or they're going to cost him another Super Bowl. He's such a stud. It's we are, we are watching. I mean, in my opinion, he could go down as one of the top quarterbacks of all time, and I don't think we're really appreciating it. We're just 
a little spoiled. We're in the moment. Well, I mean, listen, now that you're a content creator, this is kind of the vibe in the world that we're in. People consume the content, they throw it out the window and they move on to the next piece. And it's kind of like the collecting world right now. But yes, we're not really understanding what's going on with Patrick Mahomes. I mean, his top three targeted guys yesterday against the Texans, Kelsey, Juju and McKinnon. Those guys were targeted 28 times. All 28 ended up in completions. And so I think what we'll find (laughs) out here is we talk about the word MVP, V being most valuable. The drop off from Mahomes to Chad Henney is roughly 11 points in the betting world. As you're seeing right now, the drop off from Jalen Hurts to Gardner Minshew substantially less. So the, the betting market is telling you which of those guys is more valuable. Hopefully the voters We'll do the correct thing here and bring Mahomes another MVP. Okay. On to the topic of conversation. I think this is something we've talked about throughout the course of these episodes. And we've talked about all these cards being graded and why we should grade them and why your assets should be authenticated. So that's where we're going to lead off this show why you should authenticate your sports cards and collectibles. And I know this is something near and dear to you that you're passionate about and PWCC is passionate about. So I'm going to let you uh, kick us off here. Yeah, look, it's passionate for us because, you know, we have to deal with this on a daily basis. If something doesn't have authentication, we can't sell it, right? So that is the genesis of liquidity in our space comes down to authentication. You want to make sure that, as a buyer, what you're buying is what you think you're buying and that it's real. Uh, and so that that is where authentication comes into play. So if you're getting into the space and you're buying and selling, if you're not buying things that are authenticated or you're not authenticating things that you're buying that weren't authenticated, then you are costing yourself potential liquidity down the road. We know, you know eBay is a giant marketplace for what we call raw cards or cards that are unauthenticated and they have an authentication program through eBay that frankly is a joke. Um, But that being said, they still do have one. So your risk is you could buy an unauthenticated card on eBay, goes through this joke of a process, and then you can try to sell it unauthenticated down the road, I guess, on eBay, but then you're pigeonholing yourself to one platform. And there's risk from the buyer on that, There's risk for everybody, and so it's just not a great way to go about doing it. Now, grading is great. It is great for upside on a card, but you really have to know condition, right? You have to know what you're looking for because these days, and I think, Payne, you can attest to this, the the window of what makes sense to get graded and what doesn't from just a pure cost time, like all those factors that go into play, it's kind of coming down to unless you can get like, let's call it a Beckett nine five or a PSA 10 on something. Most of the time it's more beneficial to maybe just authenticate the card through another service. Like we have with MBA for a couple bucks, much faster, a couple week turn time because the risk of it grading an eight or a nine and the time it takes like that all factors into Hey, does it make sense to really get it graded? Because maybe I lose money. Maybe I break even. And then my my asset and my funds are just sitting there for four to six months for some low-level grading fee. And I didn't even get a 10 or a 9.5 and I'm not making any money. So I think that there's a lot of factors that come into play. But the, the gist of it is authentic, authenticity speaks to liquidity. And that is absolutely something that you need in this space. Yeah, I think authenticating and grading can certainly create some value with your cards and you kind of hinted at it we've heard all the stories about a guy who thinks every single vintage card he's located in his closet should be a psa 10 and they come back fours and so grading and authenticating sucks i would ignore that nonsense i i do think grading and authenticating can create value especially if you're using the right people whether it's PWCC and your Beckett and you mentioned MBA grading services. I know with PSA, Clay Cards handles all my assets. And yep. I think you have to find someone who's willing to tell you, hey, I don't think this card makes sense to grade. So you're saving money and not sending duds. But I also think in the current landscape, right, uh, the conversation's changed dramatically over yep. the last like six months. But right now, you 
gradings come back down to like $14 price points at some places. The backlogs are clearing out. So to me, it makes sense sending a lot of cards for grading more so than what you would have potentially had six months ago. I think even in break even situations, the peace of mind with cards being easier to store, you're protecting them. There's far less questioning about the authenticity. The access to your point become exponentially easier to sell when they're encapsulated. And candidly, like, you know, the one thing our, our listeners know by now, specifically our Bep the Board listeners, like I'm willing to give a, a little tough love. But if you're a collector with a five figure, six figure, seven figure collection and those cards aren't graded or authenticated, I don't think you're being smart. Right. It, it's pretty irresponsible sure. across the board, whether, you know, to your family, quite candidly, right, like flooding hurricanes down here in florida we saw an issue with homes destroyed in texas a few years ago and it got so damn cold that a bunch of pipes burst i mean that was kind of the point where i said you know i need to get my my graded assets into the pwcc vault that was the final straw and right. you know like past that nice, nice plug there Thanks. Yeah, Jose, it was I, it's not really a plug it's just you know it's, it's what i do all it's, right like if i'm willing I, to uh to do it myself i'm have no problems uh, letting others know. But like if you're passing cards down to your son or your daughter, or your wife, or your brother, or your sister, right? Like, God forbid anything happens to you, like make it easier on the loved ones, right? And having cards already great and authenticated does that. And candidly, like I've always talked to you about these situations and, you know, have given my loved ones kind of the, the diatribe, like, hey, this is who you're contacting if anything goes awry with me. And, you know, it's very simple, right? The prepaid label from PWCC comes, they do every bit of work for you, soup to nuts. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you don't have that five or six or seven figure collection laying around ungraded and unauthenticated and shoe boxes and three rows, which I just I find irresponsible at this point. Yeah, look, I I totally agree, and I think you made a really good point too. Uh, you mentioned Clay's cards. Clay's Clay's somebody that I used to grade a lot of my stuff with as well. And whether it's Clay or someone else that you know that understands cards and condition, it's really good if you're not an expert on that or you haven't studied up a lot on condition on trading cards. It's really good to have somebody like that in your corner to you know get their opinion because. You know, someone like Clay will give you his honest opinion, right? He's not gonna, he's not gonna just grade something for you to make a buck. Yeah. <laughs> He'll send it back if he, he doesn't, if he need doesn't your think bucks. it's gonna. <laughs> right, exactly. He's a long term relationship guy, so he's uh, you know he's gonna give you the honest opinion. But those are the kind of decisions that, if you haven't taken the time to study up on it and understand it from an authentication perspective, like you really need to be able to lean on somebody for that because you can waste money. You can waste time. You can waste all those things. And there's certain assets that just don't need to be actually graded. Maybe they just need to be authenticated or maybe like nothing makes sense because they're worth a dollar right? right. right. and they should just stay raw. Yep. Um, so there's, there's a litany of factors, but I just, I thought it'd be good to have a little bit more of a conversation around grading, considering that that is a big part of our market. There's some arbitrage plays there. If you want to make some money, um, there's, you know, security aspects of it that make a lot of sense for for storage and and making sure that they they are authentic i mean we just had a guy send us a 52 mantle in the mail the other day saying he had it for 30 <laughs> years and the thing looked like it just came off of a, an inkjet printer wow i mean it was awful right it wasn't even close but uh, he swore it was real and i don't know if he was trying to pull one over on us or if he's just old and really didn't know but you know, some people just don't know. Like we can look at something and in two seconds know if it's not real. And the general public doesn't have that information. So authentication is huge whether you're buying or selling. Yeah, just makes the entire process much, much easier. The one thing that we've talked about at nauseum is you mentioned time. And I think that's the other part of grading, right? I mean, you know, I'm yep. inundated during football season. I do not have any time. I'm certainly not going to be assessing cards myself or filling out paperwork. And so <laughs> that's why using <laughs> another service is uh, is the smart play here. But uh, speaking of time, that takes us to our next segment. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. It's time, folks. That's right. We're going to discuss undervalued and overvalued cards or maybe even some memorabilia assets, potentially some players. Is it time to buy, sell, or hold on to these assets or players? We'll give you some opinions and back it up. We have some interesting choices this week, and yours is a guy I absolutely love, so I'm not going to steal your thunder, but uh, your undervalued asset and player, Tim Duncan. I absolutely love that. Yeah, Tim Duncan. That's... 
that's my pick this week. He and look, this is coming from a huge Lakers fan, and I absolutely hated, hated the Spurs, hated Ginobili, hated Parker. Thought Duncan was the boringest thing on the planet, but you can't ignore his accolades. You know, you look at now. You compare him to Kobe, so both five-time NBA champions. Duncan actually is a three-time Finals MVP, and Kobe was only two-time Finals MVP. You've got a two-time NBA MVP in Tim Duncan, and only a one-time for Kobe. Uh, Duncan, 15-time All-Star. Kobe, 18. Um, 10-time All-NBA first team for Duncan. 11 times for Kobe. You've got eight-time defensive uh, All-Defensive first team for Duncan, and nine times for Kobe. But then Duncan has seven second team, and Kobe only has three-time second team. So, you know, the accolades are very, very similar, kind of kind of scary similar, and yet Kobe cards are worth a ton more than Duncan. Now, look, I get it. This goes back into us talking about brand. We've said it many times on here before. It's why, you know, Kawhi Leonard stuff isn't worth as much as it probably should be, but I just don't think, you know, a guy like Tim Duncan gets the respect that he deserves in the trading card community, especially for a guy where a lot of his rookie cards are in absolutely critical sets in our market, like the 97, um, you know, PMGs, you've got, uh, you know, the, the championship PMG. I mean, you have all these amazing cards from the nineties inserts that are Duncan's rookie year. And like, they just should be worth a ton more than they are in my opinion. Yeah. There's, there's no question. Tim Duncan cards are cheap relative to his, performance individually and some of the accolades that you just riddled off there but uh not only that he's got a better player efficiency rating all time than kobe you and go. you did and you did mention he's got as many rings i wouldn't call him a boring player right but that's why he got his nickname the big fundamental which yeah. i think spoke to his game so well arguably the greatest power forward of all time but uh didn't play in a big market he's quiet and reserved very much kind of stayed away from the scene during retirement and listen i speak to one of the largest tim duncan collectors of all time on a weekly basis and his prices remain pretty solid if you look at the last two years duncan's up 15 percent they kind of have this uh bunt single investment to them you know (laughs) but but to your point there are a handful of duncan rookies that are absolute grails because of the sets they're in you you mentioned the 1997 metal universe pmg green duncan rookie to 10 copies it's the third best card in the set behind jordan and kobe and i believe there's a possibility down the line if we have this conversation in five years 10 years 20 years the Duncan might end up superseding the Kobe in this set. I agree. You also have the Duncan Essential Credentials now to six copies. That yeah. just traded privately very recently for a massive number. So some you know extremely passionate credentials collectors will argue that that's the best credentials card ever made. And right. so there are a handful of elite Duncan cards that I think continue to make his entire player index increase. I do wonder about some of those tier two, three and four rookies of Duncan's just because he is out of the limelight. He didn't do anything flashy. There's probably not as much demand there. And I think it's basketball in general, right? We kind of see it with Shaq. It's very difficult to feel an attachment to that guy, right? The, the rest of us aren't walking around able to slam dunk a basketball without <laughs> leaving our feet, but we can all get in the backyard and launch a three like Curry or Kobe. And so you don't have that sentiment towards some of these players. But uh, I, I, again, I think, you know, speaking to this Duncan super collector pretty frequently, he definitely repositioned his portfolio, moved out of some of those lesser Duncan rookies into Jordan, Kobe, Jeter, and Griffey. But he does still have those key rookie cards that you mentioned from those prestigious sets so you're telling me people can't relate to bank shots <laughs> yeah that's yeah that's that's interesting yeah he wasn't right? playing above the rim as as no. much as other big men yeah the, he the, wasn't the bank but shot. look yeah i guess you could say the same thing about russell westbrook these days right <laughs> big bank shot guy um <sighs> not intentionally all not the time intentionally no he, sometimes he misses <laughs> the entire backboard but yes. uh yeah look there's and then you look at like Kobe's 96 Tops Chrome, the first year Tops Chrome, massive card. Um, but 
the Kobe PSA 10 for that versus the 97 Topps Chrome Duncan, it's about a 20x difference. I mean, it's a it's a massive difference in pricing. And so from an undervalued perspective, that's why I just think that there's still room for Tim to kind of close the gap on Kobe uh, for a lot of these things when you when you really compare the two. Yeah, I, I agree, especially specific to to the PMGs and, and the credentials. The 96 to 97 debate for Topps Chrome is is difficult because 96 is the first year of that. Right. So it kind of creates a, a little bit of but a 20X? difficult hurdle to overcome. Yeah, yeah, I could see That's that. A lot. Yeah, That's a yeah lot. I agree. Okay, mine is also undervalued. And I think a lot of our listeners are like, Jesus Christ, the market's going down. Why do you guys keep talking about undervalued assets? I Because there's still there's opportunities st- out there. That's why. Yes, this one is going to surprise some people. It's the 2001 Ultimate Collection Ichiro Rookie Auto to 250 copies. And to me, this card has everything you're looking for. You know, it has the Ultimate Collection brand behind it, which has this level of prestige. It's a high end product. And if you look, 2001 was the first year of Ultimate Collection baseball, and it was the first ever baseball product to hit retail stores for $100 a pack. So it it really just was a premium product. If you look at the base set, there's 120 cards. The last 30 are all serial numbered rookies. And within those 30, it's each euro's on-card auto uh, rookie. There were five of those on-card auto rookies in there. Um, There's some streaking that comes with each euro's autograph on this card. So the ones with less streaking sell for a little bit more of a premium. But based upon... The brand, the product cost, it being an on-card auto to just 250 copies, you can tell how important this card is because PSA weights this a 10 within their Ichiro registry, which means it's rare and difficult within that Ichiro registry. It's at the top of that. But I think past the actual card... You're looking at Ichiro, first ballot Hall of Famer. He's eligible in 2025. And the one thing we've seen in baseball is there's this nice little lull in price post-retirement, pre-induction. Ichiro has the global brand. And I think that brand will be aided here by Otani a little bit because of all the comparisons that we're going to start having. And Ichiro also has the milestones, right? One of 33 players to ever reach 3,000 hits. He did it at the 14th fastest rate. And I think what's really impressive about Ichiro is did not play in the major leagues until age 27. So love Ichiro, love the global status of him, love the accomplishments on the field, love the rarity of this specific card. You can buy it out of season. You can buy it during a market dip. You can buy it during the lull waiting for induction. So it just checks so many boxes for me. Yeah, it really does. Actually, this is a great pick because, you know, most people, when they talk about Ichiro, they're talking about the Bowman Chrome or the SP Authentic, right? But the 01 Ultimate Collection Auto out of 250 is a sleeper, uh, in, in my opinion. And you just don't see them trade that often. I mean, there's only 250 of them. So, you know, they're not, you know, we talk about what, like, what scarcity is, real scarcity versus perceived. Well, this right. is real scarcity. You just don't see them sell often. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, looking at the pop reports, there's only three PSA 10s and two Beckett 9.5s that have ever been graded. And there hasn't been one of those to sell in the last six years. I mean, wow, I didn't the, know that. The last PSA 10 sold in 2016 for 10 grand. In 2016, it sold for 10 grand. Yeah. I mean, that... My that mean, gut would say 5 to 7x now, even in yep. a down market. I had a, I had it at a 75K over under on that card right yep. now. Yep. Um, because it's, that's, that's true rarity. And you have Ichiro collectors that haven't had an opportunity to buy one of those in six years. There's only three PSA 10s that exist. So it's just... It's a, it's a massive card. And... You know, the fact that there are only 250 of a staple rookie for a guy internationally that is absolutely loved. I mean, he is he's the equivalent of like a Hideki Matsuyama for golf internationally in Japan. Uh, <laughs> yep. Seriously, like I'm a big golf guy, so I use that comparison. I know that Hideki is a god. When he won the Masters, I mean, he, the dude was walking on water when he would go back home. <laughs> and, and so I love cards that have international appeal to them. I think as our space continues to grow, you know, a company like Fanatics coming in is really going to they're going to broaden the the reach that people have internationally for this space. I mean, look, they're they just got valued at thirty one billion. You're telling me that they don't have plans internationally to expand this stuff? I mean, they're all in. You got a guy like Michael Rubin who is all in on trading cards. So I know part of their plan is to go international with this thing. That's how they're going to get to over a hundred billion dollar valuation. And I think a guy like Ichiro 
is a prime example of somebody that still has a ton of upside from an investability standpoint, not even just for this card, but I think in general. So I, I love this pick. Yeah, appreciate that. I, I think the other interesting thing here is when you start talking about baseball and long-term appeal, his size, his stature, I think, rids the idea of potential harm down the line for being outed for steroids. I think he's got <laughs> much less risk involved to him from that perspective as well, which which is a positive. But you mentioned a possible $100 billion valuation for Fanatics. That would be a magic number by my book. Pick a number, any number, whatever it may be. We got a number inside, but we want a magic number. All right. This is where we're going to pick a few big cards that enter in an auction over the next couple of days. And we're going to try and guess how much they sell for in advance. Throw out a number. We got one too. Three more cards that would be considered for our magic number segment this week. A little interesting. Not the, I gotta tell you, there's some good variety here, but there aren't yeah. the monsters we've grown accustomed to. This this is like going to, to be like a to lot of work. Yeah, I, I think that's a positive because, you know, the feedback we get sometimes is, hey, you know, these cards are too expensive. They're not right. even on my radar. So let's uh, start talking about cards that are potentially within the budget. And the very first one we have is a 2005 Topps Finest Gold X-Fractor LeBron James out of 29 copies. It's a BGS 9.5. This specific one is a True Gem Plus. So you have two pristine subgrades with centering and edges great card collectors love this set it's a great action photo of lebron coming in for a monster dunk talk about this one a little bit jesse and give us your magic number yeah i i really do aesthetically love this card um it actually sold as high as 30k in a beckett 9.5 in february of 2021 so a little just almost two years ago um I just I think it's a really cool card that doesn't get enough love. It's only numbered out of twenty nine, so twenty nine exists. Um, it's point five away from a BGS ten, and there are no BGS tens in the pop report. So that's that's an important metric for anyone that you know. We talk about arbitrage plays or whatnot. This is one of those plays where you could theoretically try to review it and get a bump to a BGS ten. Obviously, being a pop on BGS ten would add add value to you there. Um, this, you know, LeBron. I know markets. a company that could do that for you too. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> this, this card, and LeBron's market. Well, LeBron's market in general is down quite a bit in the past twelve months, which I don't honestly think is fair. When you look at what this guy's doing, it, you know, what's going to be thirty-eight years old here shortly, is absolutely incredible. I mean, I roll out of bed at thirty-eight, and I, I'm sore. I, you know, I, I, I don't know how this guy <laughs> gets up every night and goes and plays a, a game that's as intense as basketball and is as demanding on your body. I mean, Tom Brady can sit back there and throw a football, but, you know, LeBron's running up and down the court. He's, you know, dunking on people. I mean, the energy this guy has to keep his body in tip-top shape at his age is pretty impressive. So the fact that he's won, you know, four titles and done everything he's done, um, I don't think his market should be down as much as it is. That said... I am going to be a realist on this one, knowing that his market has been down. Uh, the This exact copy actually sold in May for $14,400. And so I'm going under that. But uh, my value on this card is $10,350. So a couple things. One, it sounds like you need more collagen in your diet. That helps with sore bones. The other thing here is <laughs> LeBron's market is is down 40% over the last three months. And we kind of know why, right? In specific to this card, you kind of hinted the peak was 30K. It's It's been a pretty volatile set because it's the third year LeBron. There's 22 variations with colors and printing plates and multiple one of ones within this LeBron run, right? You have refractors to 349 and X-fractors and reds and greens and golds and blacks and X-Fractor Blacks, you name it. So it creates false scarcity, which we talked about on last week's episode, if you want to tune into that. It's almost like the set was preparing us for the Panini days. And <laughs> you you look at the Lakers right now and the current constructs of that roster. They're out of the playoffs again, if it were to start today. And Anthony Davis just went down this past week with an injury, which the organization is saying the best possibility would be at least a month away for AD on the court. And then LeBron's going to miss today's game, Monday night's game with an ankle injury. 
I'm actually going to come in a touch lower than you, but there is some interesting factors here with you kind of pointing out this is 0.5 away from a pristine. So it creates some maybe hidden value that you know you can't properly price within the market, but uh, I am at 8,800 on this LeBron James gold X fractor to 29. The other card here is wildly different. I wouldn't call it vintage, but I would say it was in the overproduced era. But this specific version, not necessarily the case. 1987 OP Chi Berry Bonds rookie PSA 10, just 38 copies ever assessed a PSA 10. I would. You want me to lead this one off? I can do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, you take. Okay. It. So I think what's interesting about this, right? I'm more of a, I would say, baseball guy than you, but it looks identical to the 1987 Topps Berry Bonds. Mm-hmm. This is the OPG, which is the Canadian version. It's far less printed of a set. So OPG would create these sets with a higher ratio of cards of players from the two Canadian teams. And they started doing that in 1977. The final year they did it was 1988. Some of the backs were different in the OPG version where you'd have bilingual baseball facts or career highlights. Some would have the same backs as the 1987 top set. So just a real mixed bag. But just to show the difference in print run and rarity, again, 38 PSA 10 copies of this Bonds in the OPG version over 1500 PSA 10 copies of the tops version. So this one far more rare. We saw this card peak back in February of 2021. And then this past May, you guys, PWCC sold a Mike Baker black label for over 31 K. Then in June, nearly six months to the day, as we talk about this card now, PWCC sold one for 12, six bonds market is down about 16% over that stretch in in the last six months. It's not baseball season, so out of sight, out of mind a little bit. And then just a few weeks ago, which I think will play a role here, there's a group of 16 guys making up the Hall of Fame Contemporary Baseball Era Committee. They met to add guys for the 2023 Hall of Fame class, and Bonds was once again not included. So some negative news the last couple weeks surrounding Bonds in that regard. This one to me is is wildly interesting. I think there's going to be the potential for this to reach five figures if it's the right collector. I don't necessarily think we get there. I'm going to come in a little bit lower than I initially anticipated I would. I'm going to come in here at $6,727 on this one. Oh, baby. That is... That is low. That is very conservative. Okay. Look, I don't have a ton to add. I mean, that was a very informative background on this card. It It is very condition sensitive compared to the tops. And just like, you know, the, the 79 OPG Gretzky and the 79 tops Gretzky, you know, the value is much greater for the OPG version because they typically are more condition sensitive. Um, and you know, the print run on this specific card is much less. So I, I do believe that it's going to do better than you think, but it's not going to reach where it was in June. So I've actually got this card at 8135. That's a good number. So I'll, I'll be candid with you. My, my gut number, and I'll send you a picture of my notes after the segment. My gut number said 8,100. Okay. My brain said 6727. So that's where we'll go. I think you probably are going to win this one. That's just my vibe. The other card is another 80s card. This time we're going to gravitate towards football. This one's interesting to me because I don't know if everyone knows about it. Certainly casual collectors might not. It's the 1984 Tops USFL Steve Young rookie PSA 10, only 30 gem mint. 10 copies and uh, Steve Young also has a rookie card in the 1986 top set which is certainly more popular both brand and he's featured in a Buccaneers uniform but talk to us a little bit about this USFL copy yeah so I picked this one this has a lot of similarities for those who know our space the 84 star Jordan and the 86 Fleer Jordan right 84 star Jordan some people consider his true rookie and I, I don't think that there's any difference here for the USFL for 84 for Steve Young versus his 86 tops. So I love this car. I love Steve Young. I'm a Niner fan. I think his stuff is criminally undervalued. He's a three-time Super Bowl champion, and he was actually the MVP of the NFL twice. 
You know how hard that is to be to be a two time NFL MVP and how much consistency you have to have to do that and a three time Super Bowl champion. I mean, he has a slew of other accomplishments. You know, this isn't the undervalued category that we normally do. So I won't list all of them, but um, you know, I'm surprised that you can buy this card for the value that you can. Um, it's another card that hasn't sold in the last six months at auction, but the last sale was ten thousand eight hundred dollars. And for a card like you mentioned, that's only a pop thirty and a true rookie, in my opinion, you know, the fact that you can get one that affordable is pretty surprising to me when, for a guy that doesn't have very many cards um, and is a Hall of Famer. Trading cards and memorabilia have seen incredible growth as an alternative investment. The company leading the growth? PWCC Marketplace. PWCC Marketplace runs the largest weekly auction of authenticated sports cards, Pokemon cards, comic books, video games, and memorabilia in the world. PWCC Marketplace also has more than 65,000 items listed in their fixed price marketplace that you can make an offer on right now. Head over to pwccmarketplace.com and see why they're the best option for buying and selling trading cards, memorabilia, and all of your collectibles. So nines, nines are actually pretty level um, from where they were back in June when this thing sold for $10,800 in a PSA 10. And so I don't think the value is going to be too far off, but the high-end market's down a little bit in general. So I've got this one actually at $8,390. Sheesh, you're making this tough on me. Um, so <laughs> you mentioned this card, and, and it, it is rare, relatively speaking. Now, I kind of referenced that 1986 tops. Steve Young. There's only nine PSA 10 examples of that one. So the USFL version is certainly popular, but sells for about 12x less than that top iteration of PSA 10. This is a, just an interesting set overall, right? Like Reggie White is in the set. And if you know the, the backstory to this, at one point, the USFL signed Steve Young to a $40 million 43 year contract <laughs> and Steve Young accepted it because the Bengals were going to draft him number one overall and they were offering him three and a half million over five years and it wasn't even guaranteed so Young was going to get a million dollar signing bonus and then a five year non-guaranteed 500k annual salary obviously Steve Young declined decided to forego the NFL draft topped into the USFL and kind of know how that story ended as for the card it's football Steven, uh, season. Steve Young's market is actually up over the last six months. One did sell in June for $7,500. you are going to kill me here, but I actually was at 8200 That was my number. Okay, and it. so, okay, we're going to keep that number we're at 8200 <laughs> Yeah, my, my, my vibe here is this is either going to come in way under, and it may surprise us, or it's going to come in much higher. Now, it's a beautiful example. I looked at it and... It, I mean, is. It's, it, it's, it is. It's it's nice dead example. centered. Even the back with the paint like doesn't have any, yeah, any print dots. Like it's it's a solid example. It, it it really is. And look, I've actually opened a factory seal set of this before of of the eighty four tops USFL, and the cards come pretty off center. Typically, the backs are <laughs> <Yes>. pretty jacked. <laughs> like it, they're they're not in good condition. So yes, this is a very nice copy. Um, you know, our company actually valued it in the vault at 7,500. So there, I think they were a little more conservative. So I'm curious, yep. I'm curious if we're going to be right and it's going to go for in the eights. Yeah, this will be, uh, a, a very interesting one, but to your point, it rarely pops up in PSA 10 grade. And so while it might not be a ghost, there is one card that absolutely is. That's a ghost. We're going to highlight a card that hasn't sold in more than a year right now, or is serial numbered to less than 100 copies produced. We're going to talk about why this card is significant, maybe in terms of hobbies or language or just the overall rarity of it all and why it's considered a ghost. Boy, I was really excited to see this card pop onto the sheet. I wasn't sure if you knew what this card was, what the set was. And I saw it and I was like, man, I'm really excited to do this show after seeing this. It's <laughs> the 1998 Skybox Molten Metal Fusion Gold to 40 copies. This specific card is a Scotty 
Pippen. And uh, I love PMGs. I love credentials and rubies. But Molten Metal Fusion Golds are arguably some of my favorite cards. Talk to us a little bit about this specific Scotty Pippen copy. Well, a couple comments here. So, of course I know this set. This is This might be my favorite <laughs> insert from the 90s. It really is. I mean, it's an absolute gorgeous card. They're all numbered out of 40. Um, it's kind of got vertical serial numbering. It's just it's just a very cool, beautiful set. And we hadn't had a Scotty Pippen card on the show yet because there's usually not a lot to talk about. So I thought it was kind of an interesting card to do as, damn, that's a ghost. Um, you mentioned only 40 made. And I mentioned it's one of my favorite inserts. Uh, but there's only one graded higher than this in uh, for BGS because it is a very condition sensitive issue, as you all know. This one's a Beck at eight five, so there is one nine that exists. Um, but there's only one sale of this card that I can actually find ever publicly at auction, and it, believe it or not, it actually was earlier this year. Um, and a PSA nine went for thirteen thousand eight hundred dollars, and so I think what we're getting is a little bit of that scenario where. You know, the owner's taking advantage of a large comp on a card that he might have not wanted to sell, but can't ignore the fact that he's probably into this card for a few hundred bucks back in the day, and it's a great time to try to make a profit on it. So this card for me, it is a true ghost. One auction in the history of the card. There's only 40 that exist. Scotty Pippen, look, we all know the the argument to be made about, you know, Jordan and Pippen, uh, you know, Batman and Robin type of scenario. Scotty's throwing a lot of shade at Jordan lately, so that's kind of interesting. It's really, I know, like, I mean, Jordan's but, son's dating his former wife. I know, I know. <laughs> talk, talk about digging yourself a grave here, Scotty. Like, come <laughs> on, man. But he still was an unbelievable talent, and his cards in general are pretty undervalued. And this card is one that you don't see very often, so I thought it was a good fit. I mean, I I love this set, and. If you hooked me up to a lie detector test, I know it's not as important as the PMGs and the credentials and the rubies, but I do believe I like it better than than the rubies. I don't know if I can get over the hump on PMGs and credentials, but easily one of my my favorite sets. And, and basketball is serial numbered out of 40 copies, but there is that baseball equivalent to 50 copies. I actually own the Jeter jersey number version of this, so it's it's near and dear to me. But to your point, extremely condition sensitive. The all gold front, if you've actually held them in your hands, it's almost like the edges and corners have gold dust on them. Like sometimes yeah. your hand will leave with like particles. It's it's just beautiful. And uh, you have that that see-through etching. So one of my favorite sets as well. Glad you included it. And uh, just an absolute beautiful set. If you can go to PWCC or wherever you search for your cards and just get a glimpse of this, it's just absolutely stunning. There's also some foil on the front with the name and, and the logo area. And so when you kind of move it around in light, there's a nice shine to it. So an absolute fantastic set all around. This next segment, though, we're going to be comparing... I would say, I don't know if they're quite ghosts, but certainly some rarities. So we doing this or are we doing that? You tell me and we'll tell you. We're going to compare two cards right now with similar value that are completely different. Let me give you an example. Let's just say for argument's sake, you have a vintage Mickey Mantle baseball card worth $30,000. But you also have a modern-day Joe Burrow rookie card worth thirty grand. Which one would you rather have, and why? You tell us. We're going to tell you right now. The two cards that we're comparing this week are both basketball. One of the gentlemen we've talked previously about earlier in the show. The other is a really interesting card because it has a comparable to it that we have grown to love the first card here is a 2003 Fleer tradition lebron wade mellow rookie to 50 copies it's the crystal version it's a throwback to the 1980 tops bird magic rookie the other finds itself earlier in the show on <laughs> jesse's most undervalued list of the week it's a 1997 skybox essential credentials Tim Duncan, rookie, to 75 copies in a BGS 8.5. I'll let you start, kind sir. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I'm, I'm doubling down on Duncan this week. You know, it's uh, it's Duncan or bust. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But the 2003 Fleer Tradition Crystal, you got LeBron, Mello, Wade. 
out of 50 in a Beckett 9.5. It's a pop 11. There are two BGS 10s. But you mentioned the 1980 Tops Bird Magic Rookie that had Dr. J on it. You know, this is an homage to that with those three gentlemen in one of the greatest draft classes of all time. It's just a very unique, cool card, and there's only 50 that exist. I love that card. I love the look of it, how young these guys look, the fact that you got all three of them on a rookie card, and you know they're going to all be Hall of Famers. It's just a just a fantastic card that I, I really do like. And then you know we've mentioned Duncan, the 97 Skybox EX 2001 credentials now out of 75 in a, a BGS 8.5. Incredibly important Duncan card. Um, you know, Central Credentials is one of the most popular and beautiful sets that exist. And there's only 75 of these copies. It is a rookie. And I just don't think you can ignore Duncan, as I mentioned earlier, um, as, a, as a player in general. So the debate kind of here is, would you rather have an individual card of potentially the greatest power forward of all time or a rookie card with one of the greatest players of all time and a couple other studs on it. You know, there is an argument to be made in our space. I'm sure you can double down on this pain where individual cards sometimes are worth more than cards that have multiple players on them, even if they are all studs, right? So it's a, it's an interesting debate. And both of these cards sold for 10,800 on the nose uh, about a week ago. So the price is the exact same gun to my head. This is actually a hard decision. Gun to my head, I'm going to go with Duncan. I thought you were throwing me the 12 to 6 Kershaw curveball here with Duncan being undervalued atop the show, and then you included it here and you were going to go the opposite direction. What's interesting here, because I've been in the market for one of these 2003 Fleer Tradition Crystal LeBron Wade Mellow rookies to 50 copies, and you hit it perfectly. It's the homage to the 1980 Topps Bird Magic rookie that has Dr. J on it. And so there's always going to be that parallel. If that card sells for X, this has to sell for Y. The interesting part is there's there's two versions, right? The other is LeBron, Darko, and Mello. There's no weight on that second version. And on top of that, you have two base versions of both. You have a draft day version of both to 375 copies. And then the crystal version of both to 50 here. So there's more than what's necessarily stated there because you do have that version with Darko on it. I then get to the Duncan and we talked about the rare version of this card at the top out of six. This is out of 75 copies. It is Tim Duncan's rookie. This to me is just an extremely tough debate because you're going against a classic rookie card that has this sibling bird magic comp and it's to 50 copies. And it's, you know, I'm going to go with the Duncan as the collector, right? It's, it's more of a pure market, I believe, in terms of swings, right? The reason PMGs and credentials and rubies have not only held strong, but increased during this market dip is because they're impossible to obtain. The owners yep. know what they are. True collectors and even investors don't want to give them up. And they're just scarce enough where flippers can't find them. Flippers have to pay up for them, and that causes uncertainty and offloading quickly. And so flippers focus on other sectors of the market and niches, and they're kind of void from this sector of the market, which I like. And it yeah. makes it a little bit more pure. So I will go with the Duncan Rookie as well. I'd rather have that in my PC, although I think maybe if we zoomed out 20 years, the better performer might be the LeBron Wade Mellow, as you mentioned, because they are all Hall of Famers. But I, I, I have to kind of go what's what's near and dear to the heart, and that would be the the credentials card of Tim Duncan in his rookie year. Yeah, I, I knew this would be a tough decision for for both of us, and you know we'll see we'll see how it plays out. But you know from from a guy who my favorite card in trading cards is the 1980 Bird Magic rookie. Yeah. So this this was a difficult decision, and I just think that Duncan as an individual card. You know, if it was the out of six variation of Duncan, this wouldn't even be a debate, right? <laughs> like right, not even close. It's not close. Yeah, but uh, but the out of seventy five variation versus out of fifty variation, I just like an individual rookie, vertical, not horizontal, which actually does play into it, and it's just a uh, it's just a copy that you don't see come around very often. All right, buddy, I think we uh, did a good job here for episode nine. Christmas is around the corner. New Year's is around the corner. Anything going on in your life? What are the plans? 
Uh, well, we're going to take a couple weeks off for the pod, and we're going to come back swinging in January. Uh, but Ducks, go Ducks on the 28th. Let's go. <laughs> we'll get the bowl game. Bo Nix is returning next year. Bo I mean, Nix season. I'm, Bo Nix season, the Ducks basketball team, we're getting a little bit more healthy, starting to figure things out. Standard Dana Altman, they're going to, you know, they'll try to make a run to get into the NCAA tournament and hopefully kick it on all cylinders come March. Dana is is my guy, actually. He coached, is my guy. Coached one of my uh, my buddies a long time oh, ago. Oh, really? Yes. So. Absolutely love Dana Altman as a coach and a person. He's just a... He's an absolute. He's a stud. Absolute defensive stud. wizard. Defensive yep. wizard. Okay. Before we depart, anything? I'll give you the floor. Anything going on at PWCC? Hey, this is a great time to buy. Once again, Christmas time. Not as many eyes on auctions. We have Sunday auctions that close like clockwork every single Sunday. And Sunday this year happens to fall on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Trust me. Get in there. Take a look. You might find a couple deals. It's a great time to buy. Hey, should I say it again? It's a great time to buy. <laughs> there was some data that released this week that might have indicated we hit the bottom and are trending up a little bit. We'll we'll see if that comes to fruition. There was some some data that released on the interwebs. Haven't fully seen it, but Clay sent it to me and I'll I'll investigate it a little bit. But yes, perfect. Good chatting with you, my man. And we'll be yep. back for episode ten in a couple of weeks. Merry Christmas, everybody. Make sure you follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Insider. Subscribe to Bet the Board and get notified when new episodes of Cardboard Chat air on Tuesdays. And be sure to stop by pwccmarketplace.com for all your collecting needs.